Amen. Well, good evening, West End. Well, that was a mixed bag. Good evening. Everyone doing okay? I must admit, I cannot see you at all, but I'm sure you look lovely. Those lights are super bright. Um, it is great to be here. It's great to be uh, back amongst friends and family. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, I get the privilege of being part of this, uh, this family of churches, um, both here and in Belfast. And uh, I was part of this church. Uh, I've been part of this church since 2008. Uh, it was 2008, wasn't it? When Ruth and I, my wife's here with me tonight. Um, we, uh, we came uh, as students uh, here to Glasgow. And so we've been part of the, the story, the ever kind of evolving story of Rehope. And so we have the privilege of leading uh, Rehope Belfast, uh, which we started uh, just uh, three years ago. Uh, we, had our, well, we had our birthday there in January, celebrating three years of all that God's been doing uh, amongst us in Belfast. But we're part of a bigger story, part of a big family, and so we, uh, we're just delighted to be here. Uh, continuing on in our Reawakening series, and um, this, this is, for me, this has just been a really, I've loved teaching this series, I've loved being part of uh, teaching this series across uh, different locations, and I just think God's doing something special uh, not just amongst our church, but actually uh, across the lands in these days. I get the privilege of being part of some conversations uh, in Ireland uh, right now of, of, of what God is stirring. And it's just incredible what is happening. Uh, and we can kind of look at it in that way. But then on the other side of it, as we turn on the news, as, as we did this morning when we were getting ready in our hotel room, and, and, and story after story after story was just bad news, right? And yeah, and, and I'm sure you, like me, if you're looking at the news, you just go, gosh, this is, this is hard. And there's a lot of stories right now where it is hard. There was a story uh, which was on the news this morning, um, which we were watching of, of the floods. And I can't remember exactly where it was, but there was this family, and I don't know if you caught the news this morning uh, like we did. It was on around 7 o'clock, so probably not, seeing as you're here tonight. Um, <laughs> bed, right? Uh, and, and there was, there was uh, this couple who were there sharing about their house, and they showed the pictures of their house, which was literally completely underwater. Uh, all but maybe, what was it, two inches above the waterline was showing of their house. Like, absolutely tragic story of just how the floods are just wrecking so many people's lives. But the thing I found so amazing about this couple was they were so humble in spite of losing everything. And they shared this story of how it was their granddaughter's birthday uh, a couple of days prior. And, uh, and they, you know, they've lost everything. And they put out this, um, uh, I think it was friends of theirs, put out just like, would you help this, this family who've lost everything um, at this tragic time? It's their granddaughter's birthday. They've lost everything. And, th and they were just inundated with gifts. Over 150 presents turned up at the house where they're staying random people just being generous to them. But on top of the presents, they've been receiving donations, money, saying, we want to help you get your feet back. We want to help you to, you know, get your house in order and all this kind of stuff. And they were just sharing, like, we are, we are so amazed at the love and the generosity of people who don't even know us. But then the thing that really caught my attention in this story was that they went, we're so grateful for the money, but we're giving it all away. And it's not because we have lots because we've lost everything. But it's because we know that there's other people who need this more than we do. And so we want to be generous and give back. I want to talk tonight on this whole area of generosity. Because for some of us, even right now, as I begin to talk around generosity and being generous, some of you are thinking, oh no, they've brought in the guy from Belfast to talk to us about giving and giving money because Laura didn't have the guts to do it. <laughs> it's not true. She talks about you and money all the time. No, that's a joke. That's a joke. Um, she's going to tell me off later. But here's the thing. I I'm going to touch on money a little bit, but not much. Because what I want to get in our spirits and our souls tonight is the whole idea that we read in Scripture is that God is a generous God. That all the way from the beginning of Scripture in Genesis 1 all the way through to the final pages in Revelation and the continuing narrative that, we that is our lives and those who've gone before us, is that God is a generous God. Ge God created the heavens and the earth. That's what we read in, in Genesis 1. God is a generous God who made the universe. 
There is nothing more generous than that. But then he went, you know what? You guys are messing up. I'm going to send my one and only son into the midst of the brokenness of the world. And he is going to die a death so that you would know forgiveness. That is generosity through and through. And so all through the pages of scripture, we find this generous God. And as part of this series, what we want to be doing is asking the big questions of our faith and of our church to say, what does it look like for us to be reawakened to that God who is generous? That would we come to know who he is and what he's done so that we in of our lives would begin to live a life of generosity? I, I, I was, I've been reading this great new book by Pete Hughes, who's the pastor of KXC in London, uh, a book titled All, All Things New. And in it, he had this line, which just stuck with me because it so relates to what we're Uh, what we're doing right now in this series but he says this the church that's you and I the church needs to be revived if the city is to be reawakened you see what we're wanting to ask the questions we're asking through this series like Laura spoke on last week on Sabbath and and all the other topics we've been looking at is that we need to become a a reawakened to the God of the Bible so that we would then see the city revived We can be praying the prayers for revival for the city, but unless we begin to get our hearts right before God, then I don't think we're going to see things change. Yes, God can move, and God will move in mighty power in ways that we have yet to see. But we need to become reawakened to who he is, to what he's doing, so that we can see the city revived, so that we can see culture renewed, so that we can see our workplaces, our families, coming back into a place of fullness of God. But that starts with you and I. And like I spoke on a few weeks ago when I was here from the passage from uh, Two Kings with Elijah. And Elijah was stood before the kings and the principalities and powers of the day. And he said to them, stop wavering. Stop wavering. Stop worshiping Baal. And he said, if Baal is God, go ahead, worship him. But if God is God, worship him. And so the same call that I want to give us tonight as we're going through this series is, if this God, the God of the Bible, is the one true God, then this is, if this is what we were proclaiming, our whole lives including that of generosity, need to be marked by us become reawakened to the God of the Bible. And we need to stop wavering. We need to stop wavering. We need to start worshiping him in spirit and in truth. So with all that said, let's dive into Matthew's gospel. And we're going to go to Matthew 26. And what we find right now is this is near the end of Jesus' life. He's, he's on the journey on the final few markers towards the cross. And we could call this the la- this moment, is, we could call it the Last Supper before the Last Supper. So he's, 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 we find him in Simon the leper's house, and he's having a supper before the Last Supper. Just before we get to this verse, we find that Jesus has announced to those who are gathered around him in verse 20, uh, verse 20, chapter 26, verse 2. He says, as you know, the Passover is two days away, and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified so he's told them this is what's happening you you've heard it already but here it is again i'm going to be crucified i'm going to die the time is coming it's two days away and then we come to this point in verse six so it says this while jesus was in bethany in the home of simon the leper a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume which she poured out on his head as she as he was reclining at the table when the disciples saw this they were indignant why this waste they asked This person could have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor. Aware of this, Jesus said to them, Why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. When she poured the perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Would you join me in praying just as we enter this scripture? And so, Father, I simply ask now that you, by your goodness and grace, would be busy amongst us in this room. Would you reveal yourself, reveal truth, speak over our hearts, our minds, remove any distractions that we might have in this moment. Help us to be present before you as you present yourself through your scriptures. Help us, each and every one of us, to be reawakened to the God of the Bible. May we know you, may we grow in our love for you, and may we take a step towards being generous people out of an overflow of the generosity that you give to us. So Spirit of God, come, we ask in your mighty name. Amen. Amen. Well, I want to speak tonight from the title of generosity, but I want to give it a subtitle, which may well come on the screen, I don't know. But the subtitle is this, break the jar, break the jar 
the jar. This church, and I've been struck by it as I've gone around all the locations uh, today. I've had the joy of being up in Royston, down at the south side. Um, this church is awash with generosity. I, I sent a message around to all the lead pastors this week and just said, friends, can you just share me one or two stories of ways that the church has been generous recently? And they sent me story after story after story of individuals, of, of groups of people who are doing things out of a heart of generosity towards others. And some of those things are in the scene and they're things that we know about and things we maybe share from the stage. But many of them as well are in the unseen, in the unspoken, in the acts of kindness and generosity that go unnoticed. The things that people do without looking for applause. The money that is given, the time that is given, the talents that you exhibit in the scene, on the stage, at the door, in making coffee, but also in the unseen in the faithful small acts and in the big ways. There's so many stories of what is going on in the life of this church, of faithful obedience, of sacrificial worship. And this is what the church is all about. The church, big scene, the ecclesia, the group of people gathered together around a common cause. And it's not a cause to make my name great, your name great. It's not about putting our name up in lights to say, look what we've done, thank me, applaud me. It's about saying, how do we point others to Jesus? How do we begin to do that with lives poured out in sacrifice, in generosity? Because generosity is not about us helping others to see that we're nice people, which, you know, that's, that's part of honor. You see something that someone's done and you say thank you. But more than anything, we want to be generous so that the world would see the generous heart of God towards his people. And what we find in this story, as we come back to Matthew 26, is this woman enters into the scene at Simon the leper's house. Jesus and his disciples are gathered around there, about to have a meal, and we read that Jesus is reclining at the table. He, he's taken a posture of relaxing, in spite of the fact that he's just declared, I'm about to die in two days' time. And so we find him reclining at the table, and then enters into the scene, this woman. She's unnamed in Matthew. But she enters into the scene, and what she performs in this moment, in a normal setting, is a very normal thing to do. But she goes above and beyond and does something radical, something extravagant. Because just picture it for a moment. You've got a group of guys who've come in from, and they've been out traveling. And they'd have been wearing long robes and the roads would have been dusty. They'd have been out in the heat of the day and they'd have come in stinking. But there's no, let's just call it for what it is, there's no deodorant in that day and they'd have stunk. And so they come in and they're sat down at the table and there's a whole bunch of them in a room and it's hot and sticky and smelly. And so the normal thing, the custom of the day would have been that the, the, the person who, who's received them in their home would come in and would anoint them with oil. It's a sign of welcome, it's a sign of honor, it's a sign of respect. And they'd have put a bit on their, on their forehead or maybe put it a bit on their feet. And part of it is honor and showing love to them. But another part is saying, you stink, I don't want my house to stink, we're going to have a nice meal together, let's make this room smell nice. I mean, if you've been, you know, you light a candle in your room before people come in, it's a very similar thing. You know, you have the potpourri, potpourri, that's a very, like, 90s thing, right? But you have something that's going to spruce up the room to make it smell nice when people are entering. This is a very similar thing as they're doing this. And, and so as this woman, this unnamed woman walks in, she comes in with her alabaster jar filled with perfume, and she begins to pour it out over Jesus who is reclining but she doesn't just pour it out a little she pours the whole jar out till there's nothing left and it's to the point with the disciples those who are sat around with her they begin to look at her and say why the waste what are you doing do you not know that that's a precious commodity that that that's precious what are you doing I mean how precious is it we ask in Mark Mark's gospel tells us that it was a whole year's wage, 300 denaria it would have cost. A whole year's wage, and she's just poured it all out in one go. Why the waste, they ask? What are you doing? You see, we, we can ask that same question. We look on and go, what in the world made her do that? What a ridiculous act to commit. What a waste. It's crazy. It's over the top. But this is the thing. That's exactly what it was. It was crazy. It was over the top. 
It was an act of love and honor that went beyond what was fully expected of her. Her walking in with the alabaster jar filled with perfume was not weird. It was very normal. It was customary. But what she did was crazy and over the top. It was faith and abundance where she just began to pour out everything. And I think here's the thing that I'm just so struck by. She would have known that, that Jesus was on his way to the cross. She knew of what Jesus was about to do. And what she does in this moment is she couldn't deal with restraining herself in the praise and adoration that she wanted to pour out on Jesus. So she lost all restraint. And she's looking at Jesus lying down about to receive dinner. And she's showing him love and honor in the customary way. But she just loses all restraint. And she just gives it everything that she's got. You see, if I'd ask you a question right now, when it comes to worshiping Jesus, when was the last time that you lost all restraint? You lost all restraint because you realized the magnitude of the sacrifice and the generosity that he's poured out on you. When was the last time you lost restraint? Because I think for some of us, if not all of us, and I'll be bold enough to say this because I get on a plane later, but I think for a lot of us, we're so constrained in our worship. We're so constrained in our worship. And when I'm talking in worship, I'm not just talking about our singing, because that's only but a part. I'm talking about our worship towards God with everything that we've got. And let's just think about it in the worship context of singing for a moment. You know, we, we read of the goodness of God through Scripture, and we read of His heart of love for us, and we read of his forgiveness for us. And if you're in a read-through, you're reading this day by day, week in, week out, and you're sharing shares in your read-through, and you're like, God is amazing. And we come into church on a Sunday, and we have the privilege of singing songs and joining in with the band, and, and we get this beautiful choir of voices, and we begin to sing, and there's something within us that just goes, God is so good. I hope no one can hear me. Because I'm out of tune, but God, God is so good. And there's something within us that just gets wrapped up and constrained. And we, we, we get worried about what others are thinking about us. And we, we kind of do the whole exact opposite to what this woman did. This woman was, it was costly in her worship. She abandoned everything of what she had and she poured it all out. But I think for some of us, we need to break out of that. And we need to begin to live in a different spirit. And that's the spirit of the woman. Where we just go... God needs everything because he is so good. And we begin to lose our restraint. I think for some of us, we like to stay in the safe and comfortable. We like to worship in the cozy. But I think for some of us right now, God is wanting to say to you, break out of that restraint. Begin to live in a different way. Begin to see that God is so good, that he has given you everything, that he has poured it all out for you. And we need to move into a place where we begin to give lose our restraint maybe become a little bit more charismatic <laughs> begin to become more expressive and I worship this morning at the south side I, I shared this story this morning but in the south side Ruth nearly poked my eye out in worship like I think we need more stories of eyes being poked out in worship because someone's gone God is so good you, you know, there's no space in the rows here and so maybe there are more eyes going to be poked out as we just express ourselves in worship, in extravagant praise, I had to take two steps to my right because my wife was so like, Jesus! <laughs> you know, we can come to sing songs that we just sung there of Waymaker. You know, Waymaker. You're the miracle worker. You're the promise keeper. You're the light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Like, that's a de declaration of the promises of God. And we go, wow, God is so good. But we, Waymaker. Like there's something about when we come to sing these songs that are promises of the declarations of scripture this is who you are we just go bam like, and I'm not saying we all need to raise our hands in worship that's not it's about a posture of the heart but it's about an expression Why? like we need to break out of the restraint that we feel God is so good God is so good and this is what this woman did she poured out everything that she had she lost all restraint I want to read you this quote from John Tyson. He's a pastor in the States, and he says this, Every spiritual blessing, fullness and restoration, inclusion and provision, access and authority is given to us in Christ. 
This has tremendous ramifications for how we live and love. Knowing that we are new creatures enables us to live with spiritual confidence and break free from the lies of the past. And catch what he says here. Knowing that we have every spiritual blessing creates in us a generosity of spirit, enabling us to pass on what we have received from God. And living from God's favor and fullness enables us to pour ourselves out on behalf of others. Rather than seeing them as competition in our quest for meaning and worth, knowing that we are under blessing enables us to partner with God in bringing his message to the world so that others may experience the grace and restoration he intended. Knowing that we have every spiritual blessing creates in us a generosity that we can't help but pour ourselves out on behalf of others. And we do this so that the world would know how good he is, his love for us. You see, if we go all the way back to Genesis, what we find in Genesis, very near the beginning of creation, is that one of the first things that human beings do is that we begin to sin. That we begin to sin. And the sin that we have is, is on a bent towards selfish ambition and pride. And we see this time and time and time again throughout Scripture, and we see this lived out in our day-to-day reality now, that we are selfish people with a bent towards selfish desires and selfish ambition. And what we find in Scripture, just to pick on a few stories, we look at the, the Tower of Babel, for example. They build up this tower to make their name great. Not the name of God known, but to make their name great. We think of David. David lusts after Bathsheba. Bathsheba was not his wife. She was the wife of someone else. And so David sent that man to the front line where he was killed. David did that out of selfish ambition. I want what is not mine. This story after story, just read through the kings, or the book of the kings, all the kings in the Old Testament, time and time and time again, wanting to make their name great, wanting to claim more territory, more land, put God down, make their name known, over and over and over again. But Paul in his letter to the Philippians says this, that we are to do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but rather in humility we're to value others above ourselves. We're to do nothing out of selfish ambition. So what does that look like for us when it comes to generosity? I think there's three things that I want to raise before we go on. The first thing is this. I think God is wanting to reawaken us to the truth of who he is. When we're thinking about selfish ambition and pride, one of the keys to reawaken our spirits towards what it means to live selfishly is that we begin to see who God is, that he is not selfish, that he gave everything for us, that he loves us, that he is so compassionate and kind and generous, that he's so full of love and mercy. So we need to be reawakened to who God is in the scriptures. And then this leads us on out of that into worship. Because when you begin to understand who God is and all that he's done for you, you can't help but worship. You can't help but have an overflow in your heart of going, wow, God, thank you for what you've done, for your sacrifice. Wow, I can't believe that you forgive me. Gosh, and it just leads you into this place of worship. And then out of the back of that, it leads you into a changed life. Because you can't help but sit in a posture of worship for long enough that your whole life begins to change. Your priorities, where you were once selfish and bent towards selfish desires and ambitions, you begin to go, oh my goodness, I've got my priorities all wrong. And your heart begins to break towards the things of God. And it begins from a place of understanding who God is, being drawn into a position of worship, and then being spat out the other side in this beautiful, reconciled state where you go, God is so good, I'm going to live my life differently. You see, this is what we find with this woman. She has seen and heard that Jesus is going to sacrifice everything that he's got for her. And she pours out everything that she has for him. Her whole life is changed. We read in the scriptures over and over and over and over again of God's generosity towards us. In John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he took everything from us and gave us nothing. That's not what it says. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. It's such a generous act. But we think of Romans 8, verse 32, he who did not withhold his own son but gave him up for all of us. Or 1 Timothy 6, verse 13, God who gives life to all things. This is who God is. He's a generous, generous God. A God who gives good gifts to his children. He's a generous God. And so when we begin to get our minds right towards this is who God is and what he's done, it then leads us into a place of worship and then it leads us to a place of our changed life. Living out of a changed life. This is who God is. I'm going to worship him and my life is changed. And so maybe where we were once in a place of selfish ambition and pride, 
through that process of seeing who God is, we then begin to see that what we have, our money, our time, our talents, are not ours. Are not mine to use and manipulate for my own good, but rather they're to give back to God who gave them to me in the first place. And so we have a change of heart. Where no longer is it me who lives for me, for what I want, but out of seeing who he is and what he's done for me, moving into a place of worship and adoration and thanks and praise, and being changed from the inside out, moved from glory to glory, through his spirit revealing more truth in me, I begin to live a different life. What I have is not mine. And so I give it back. I give back my time. I give away finance. I give away my talents to see his kingdom come and his name be known in these lands. And it begins with us being reawakened to who God is. But here's the challenge. And this is what we see with the woman. You see, the woman had this jar, this alabaster jar. And inside was the perfume. You see, I think these two things represent so much for us as we think about generosity. You see, the generous act that she made came from the perfume. The jar was what held the perfume. This woman could have held herself back from pouring out the perfume on Jesus. But what we read in John's gospel is that she broke the jar. She broke the jar. And she poured out everything that was in the jar. And so the perfume becomes this miracle moment of worship. But she could have held on to the jar. See, I think we could talk about the jar. And the jar in that moment can represent all sorts of different things for that woman. It could represent wealth and stability and comfort. Because it would cost her whole year's wages are in that jar. 300 denarii. And she could say, I'm not going to pour this out on Jesus because this keeps me safe. It's my finance. And so I'm going to keep it in the jar. Or I'm going to keep this in the jar because I don't want to look stupid before everyone else. And so wrapped up in this jar is a miracle, is, is something significant of worship, but I'm going to hold on to it because of my pride. Or it might just be fear is the jar. I fear what others are going to think, and so I, I'm going to keep this within the jar. You see, I think for many of us, this is so true, is that we all have time, we all have talents, we all have finance, but we hold them close within a jar. And so what does that jar look like for you? Well, that jar could be fear. I don't want to give of time because I'm fearful of what that means for my diary. Or I've got that next flit show that I just love to watch and I, I've, I've planned it out and I've planned out when I'm going to watch it and my time is precious to me so I don't want to give that away and I'm a bit fearful of what that looks like. So I, that talent or that time I've got, I'm going to keep hold of that and put it in a jar called fear. I'm going to keep that at home. I don't want to give of my money because I've worked hard for this. And so I'm not going to give that away so I put it in a jar and it's wrapped up called comfort. Or I don't want to give up my time because, you know what, I gave my time to somebody before and, and they never said thank you for me, for giving up time. And actually, I feel really bitter about that. And so my time, well, I'm going to put that in a jar and I'm going to put that on, this, on the side as well. And before you know it, we have, each of us within us have the means for something to break out in someone's life. And let's just call it a miracle but we hold on to it and we place it in a jar that we hold safe. But what this woman did, which is so amazing, is that she broke the jar. She broke the jar and she poured out every single drop of the perfume over Jesus. You see, we all hold on to stuff. Stuff that we hold dear, stuff that we want to keep close and we want to keep ourselves comfortable but I think for each and every one of us, we need to recognize right now that what we have inside that jar could be the means for a miracle in someone else's life. 
that time that you give to, to love and serve someone, that could be the very miracle that someone needs to break out of an addiction or, or a place of pain or hurt. But you hold on to that out of a place of, I want to protect what I have because it's mine. I don't want to give that away. Or that money that you might give into the offering and uh, to be a blessing to the church here, well, you go, I, I need that because I'm saving up for that holiday that I really want to go on. And so I don't want to give away of that because that would mean giving up something of myself because I've worked hard for that. And before you know it, you've actually landed back at a place of selfish ambition and pride because you've placed it in a jar. But I think today God's wanting to say to us, break the jar break the jar break the jar begin to see that inside of every jar as you break it there's the potential for a miracle to come forth in someone's life you see each and every one of you have within you the means for a miracle I love the story of the boy with the five loaves and the two fish and we could expand this kind of metaphor and say well what would it look like where Jesus and the disciples are on that hillside and the disciples look around and see that everybody's hungry and, and the disciples are going, just send everyone home. They're starting to grumble and Jesus says, no, no, no. There's a miracle that's going to come forth that's going to feed the people and the disciples are hesitant and they go, no, it's not going to happen. And then this little boy comes forward with his five loaves and two fishes which his mummy has packed for him and said, here's your lunch. But now this boy brings it forward towards Jesus and says, here, have it. Take it. You see, what if that little boy had wrapped it up in a jar and had thought to himself, I'm not going to give that to Jesus because I doubt. I doubt that he can do anything with it. There's tens of thousands on this hillside. What is my little lunch going to do for them? And so out of selfish ambition, selfish desires because I want to feed my own stomach and I doubt that Jesus could really use this. I'm going to hold this for myself. And so he puts it in a jar and holds it. Or what if his jar in that moment was fear? Fear of his mummy when he gets home later and he has to go up to his mom and say, Mom, I know you gave me lunch earlier, but I gave it away to that guy Jesus on the hillside and I'm really hungry. And his mom turns to him and says, What? You gave away your lunch? And he just shrinks back in fear. You know, maybe he wraps up that lunch and puts it in a box called fear and but he didn't he went before Jesus and he broke that jar and he said here's all that I have these five loaves and two fishes just take it and use it do whatever you want with it and we know as the story goes on that Jesus breaks the bread and he breaks the fish and he gives it to the disciples and there is more than enough for over 10,000 men plus all those who were 5,000 men and all the women and children so there had been a number of over 10,000 gathered on the hillside and then at the end of the story we read that there are 12 baskets of food left over you see that little boy had no idea that the very thing that he brought before Jesus at that moment was the very means for a miracle to take place but he could have held it but he didn't he gave it away you see what would it look like for you with the time, the talents, the finance that you've got to be willing to give it away and say, Jesus, I don't know what you want to do with this, but I give it away anyway. And I give it back to you because it was yours in the first place. I've moved from a place of selfish pride and ambition and desire for myself and I've seen who you are and I'm amazed and I've moved to a place of worship and adoration because you are so good. You're the way maker, you're the miracle waker and I move into a place of my life is changed and no longer am I living for myself, but I'm living for you. And everything that I've got, my time, my talents, my gifts, my skills, my abilities, my finance, however small or large it is, God, I give it to you because I've moved from a place of being selfish into a place of giving everything back to you because you've given me everything in the first place. You see, friends, this is what it looks like to be reawakened with our generosity, that we move to say, I'm going to break this jar. Whatever it is that I'm holding back, Whatever I've put in this jar, whatever I've labeled this jar as, and whatever I'm holding on to, I break it because I'm no longer being held by selfish ambition. I'm no longer held by the past and, the, and, the, and the, maybe the mistakes I've made or the things that someone has said to me, which is then holding me back from stepping into the promises you've given me. I'm moving forward and I'm breaking that jar and I'm with the woman who, who sat at your feet and poured out everything that she had because it was never hers in the first place but also notice that the woman she gave away a whole year's worth of wages and the disciples looked at her and said what are you doing? what's this waste? and Jesus said 
what she's done is going to be proclaimed for years and years and years to come because it's going to have to faith and here we are today millennia later talking about her act of generous faith where she gave it all she gave it all I want to end with this story maybe the band want to come up there's this story that, um, that someone from my Bible read through shared with me it's a story of a little girl called Hattie Mae Wyatt you see because some of us you can hear this story uh, or this whole talk and think but what I have to give is not much the money that I have the, the time that I have the, the talent that I've got it just doesn't feel much it feels really insignificant we'll hear this story a six year old girl lived near Grace Baptist Church in Philadelphia, USA. She attended a very crowded Sunday school. And she had a conversation with the minister, a guy by the name of Russell Conwell. And he said to her, well, she said to him, this place is too crowded. I hope that you will build a larger building because I'm too afraid to go into that space. And he replied, when we get the money, we will construct one large enough to get all the children in. Two years later, in 1886, Hattie May died. After the funeral, Hattie's mother gave the minister a little bag that she found under the girl's pillow. And inside, it had a note. And wrapped up in the note was some money. This eight-year-old, at the point of her death, had written this note to help build bigger so that more children can go to Sunday school. To help build bigger to help more children go to Sunday school. And inside that note was 57 cents. 57 cents. And we can ask the question, well, what good does 57 cents do? How far can that small offering, that small act of general, how far can that go? But what the minister decided to do is he set up a charity a fund called the Wyatt Might Society. And he began to invest that 57 cents. And then 26, late, 26 years later, he got up and gave this talk entitled The History of the 57 Cents. And the minister explained the results of the 57 cent donation, that they'd expanded that small donation, and that as a result of it, the church, with a membership of 5,600 people, that they developed a hospital where tens of thousands of people had been treated, that 80,000 young people had been funded to go through university, that 2,000 people had been trained up in the church to then be sent out to preach the gospel. And all of this had begun because Hi Hi Hattie Mae Wyatt had given 57 cents. You see, we can look at what we have and we can say it seems insignificant. We can look at what we give and think it seems insignificant. But we need to recognize that what is within our jar that is so significant in the kingdom. It is so significant. And what we bring before God, whether it's five loaves and two fishes to feed 10,000, or whether it's 57 cents that goes on to see thousands of people receive the gospel, every single thing, whether it's money, whether it's gifts, whether it's time, it matters for God and it matters to see his kingdom come and his name be known but the challenge for each of us here is are we willing to break the jar are we willing to break the jar are we willing to step into that place where we're no longer held by fear or worry anxiety worry over our finances if I give this much well, what's going to happen or if I give up this time to spend that time mentoring that person or, or developing in that person or if I give up my time to serve on the kids ministry oh my gosh my time's precious friends God is such a generous God he's not going to leave you shortchanged. he's with you in all seasons he's after your heart he's after your heart will you give that to him and I don't know where you're at in your faith tonight I don't know where you are on your journey with God. But hear me when I say this. God is just after your heart. And out of that, your response will be whatever your response is. As you are moved from that place of seeing who God is, understanding his character, his faithfulness, his love for you, moving you into a place of worship where you lose restraint because he is so good. And out of that comes a changed life. Break the jar. Pour out what you have to Jesus because he 
is so generous to you. Would you pray with me?